I'm JC Hutchinson. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. So as I said, I'm JC Hutchinson. I uh, graduated from UC Berkeley in 2019. I actually began my studies there studying nutritional science, um, but quickly realized that that was, um, the approach was very downstream. Um, ultimately, I ended up switching to molecular environmental biology uh, with a focus in human and environmental health, which took a more upstream approach to um, food access and a lot of other issues that we see. Um, I, from there, started uh, serving in AmeriCorps National Health Corps Chicago. Um, so I acted as a food justice coordinator. I worked in Maywood. Uh, lived in Irving Park um, and really enjoyed my time there. We did a lot of important work with food distribution, especially as uh, COVID-19 hit. Um, so from there, I moved on to working at a food recycling brokerage um, and was a food waste solutions specialist. That's where I gained a lot of this knowledge. Uh, very niche knowledge. Uh, so I'm really excited to share it with everyone because I do feel like it's not talked about too often. We all know that food waste is a big problem, but um, the specifics seem to go unspoken about. These days I'm uh, you know, working less in the corporate food recycling um, sphere, but I you know, do work a lot with my community compost program, community fridges. Um, I work in corporate social responsibility, which you know, uh, is, an interesting space to be in. And a fun fact is that I recently got my beekeeping certification. So I'm a beekeeper. Any bee needs, let me know. Um, I also want to say that I, while I do have like very specific niche information on this, I definitely want to approach this as more of a conversation. Um, you know, I have this information that I'm bringing to the table, and I know that a lot of you are experts in different ways. So uh, just so everyone knows about halfway or maybe a little more than halfway through this session, we'll switch over to a collaborative platform um, where everyone can bring their ideas to the table and we can talk about this more holistically. So that being said, if anyone's tuning in from their phones um, at that point, uh, if it's challenging to get to the third party platform, feel free to just type into the chat whatever you need to chat, but definitely would be preferable if you could access it from a computer. And then any questions you have, please throw them into the chat. I have the box up on my screen here. So I'm happy to answer things as they come up. All right, so um, we're gonna be talking today just kind of to guide this conversation. Why is pre-consumer food waste a concern? Uh, what are current types of practices is for processing this food waste and what types of organizing um, is necessary and impactful uh, in, in this space. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, some questions to keep in mind as we go through this conversation, you know, a lot of this is uh, more factual um, rather than, you know, any morality, um, you know, any, any me speaking to morality of things. So what I want to do is take this information and then later on together consider who are these things harming, who is benefiting from these practices, and how can the system be reimagined um, as we move forward into the future of our food system. Wanted to add a trigger warning in here. We're talking about pre-consumer industrial food waste. There are some yucky concepts, yucky photos. It's not anything too horrible, but there are pictures of raw meat and food and dumpsters and you know just things that can be triggering overall. Next slide. All right, so what is industrial food waste? There's a lot of ways to uh, define pre-consumer food waste, um, but today specifically we'll be talking about industrial food waste mostly. So that's food waste coming from the manufacturing, packaging, and distribution parts of the supply chain. We're not going to be focusing as much um, as grocery store waste or store waste in general. This is more so like in a, in a big, like bulk type of scenarios. 
So um, on to the next one, please. Sorry about that, one second. Sorry, I clicked on a tab. Right. Yeah, I have all of my, so anyone who ends up wanting this PowerPoint at the end, I've hyperlinked everything or added my sources at the bottom. Um, so that is what we're, what we're working with right now. Perfect. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Oh, it might Sorry. be challenging because it might be a whole. Hold on one second, let me, there we go. Perfect, thank you. All right, how big of a problem is it? Um, we've all heard of food waste. Um, a lot of us are composting or being really mindful of our food waste at home, but between 30 and 40% of total food production is lost before it's even at the market. Um, so this is the pre-consumer food waste that we're talking about. That's a lot of food that's being wasted. Um, okay, next slide. So this is just a little, uh, TikTok. So people might have seen these videos of people dumpster diving or looking into the, the trash bins of grocery stores or I've even seen like Michael's or other types of uh, stores where perfectly good stuff is kind of just thrown away. So that's what we're wanting to avoid. Um, who came before us? That's something that I'm always trying to think about and look to for advice and practicality. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have seen pictures like the ones on the right, um, you know, various leftovers in the plastic containers that, you know, we kept a butter in or other, you know, other goods, um, our cookie tins used for selling supplies maybe tires used as garden planters. Uh, there's a lot that's been done in the past. And so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to necessarily buy all of the fancy, um, you know, things that people say that you need to buy. I think that what we, I think what could be really beneficial is moving away from the consumerist mindset and looking back to what has already been done. Um, I also wanna mention that France has actually banned the practice of burning, dyeing, cutting of all of uh, this stuff that has not hit the market yet, which I think is a really great progress and hopefully sets a precedent for the rest of the world. Uh-oh, okay. Ligia, let me know. I can throw some headphones in if people continue to have issues. Um, great. So yeah, burning, dyeing, cutting, these are methods that people might have heard of, people doing in the fashion industry, and it happens in food as well. I've personally heard of stories where they, there were excess hot dogs, and instead of throwing them directly into the dumpster, they would add the additional expense of purchasing blue dye to pour onto the hot dogs uh, to make it look rancid to people who might be rummaging through the bins. So just really creative uh, tactics for preventing this. So some of you might've heard of the food recovery hierarchy. Um, this is, these are the EPA guidelines for the preferred to least preferred ways of um, mitigating this issue. Um, so we're gonna be going through these in great detail over the next few minutes. Um, so I really want to drive home that um, we all consider how are these decisions being made? Um, the decisions are being made from the perspective of corporations and with a dollar sign attached to them. Um, and I also want to be very clear that the experience that I have and you know the, the perspective that I'm providing today, I'm not sympathizing with corporations, but I am showing what what they're thinking. Um, and hopefully what we can do is take that information and use it to break down their arguments, right? 
Um, so as we go th through this, I want to consider the pros and cons of these practices for humans, animals, neighborhoods, uh, and the environment overall. So we'll start with source reduction. Um, this is the most preferred method uh, from as per the EPA. So source reduction, some incentives. It's likely going to save money in the long term to reduce your waste um, as someone who is uh, packaging and processing food. Um, and then there's just less waste generated. That's something that they can, you know, win awards for or, you know, things like that. Um, there's no need for upcycling or recycling or paying a hauler. So some disincentives. Um, the status quo is often easier. It's hard to, you know, teach an old dog new tricks, as they say. Um, if something is working good enough, it's hard to convince someone to change that. There's often going to be upfront costs with this. So things like consulting fees, new equipment, potentially breaking contracts with your current waste provider. So oftentimes when you're working with a landfiller, you lock in a certain contract. You say, I guarantee that we will provide this many tons of goods over the next five years. If you can't hit that quota, then you're, you're infringing upon your contract. Anyone who financially benefits from their waste is going to push back and they're going to push back hard. So that includes waste haulers, that includes people who might be purchasing this waste, that includes um, you know, composters, people in the animal feed industry, and we'll get into all of that. Um, and then it requires buy-in. So a lot of these facilities, um, they're already you know, putting out fires constantly. So to create this action plan, to escalate it to corporate, to get approval, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's that there's not often capacity for. So um, in terms of a case study, um, I worked with a packaging facility that had this new fancy equipment installed when they had really high volume. Demand decreased. They no longer needed to produce that high volume, but in terms of meeting their quota and um, reaching their return on investment, they just continued to process it regardless. Um, so that's just an example of what you might see in this space. To the next slide, please. All right, next we're going to talk about uh, feeding hungry people or donation. So these incentives here uh, for the corporations, there's tax write-offs, uh, corporate greening, so you know they can make their claims on their packaging, on their websites, make their commercials. They can claim zero waste to landfill, which I believe is now an actual stamp on packaging that people are using. So, you know, it's the optics and people look good when they're doing this. Um, disincentives or, you know, reasons that this might be challenging, storage space. A lot of donation centers just simply don't have the space to accept a huge, huge donation. Oftentimes projects I would work on would be 50 truckloads, 50 semi truckloads of material, um, each truck carrying 20,000 pounds of food. That's a lot of space. Um, there's also concerns around litigation. You know, am I going to get sued if I donate this and something goes wrong? Um, the donation center resources are limited. Oftentimes, food banks um, have limited space, don't have loading docks don't have, uh, and I know a lot of us um, may be familiar with the Chicago Food Depository, and that is honestly a diamond in the, in the rough nationwide. Uh, they have loading docks, they have trucks, you see them driving around all the time, and it's a beautiful thing to see, um, but unfortunately a rarity. A lot of the times these goods are packaged in bulk. Um, you know, there's not enough information about what materials, how much materials, what's wrong with the materials, when the materials expire. Um, so it becomes challenging for a donation center or food bank to even agree to receive something like this, you know. Um, so, and then additionally, there's a net loss. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to donate something, but then you have to pay for the haul, that is a deterrent. 
Um, so an example is a donation was set up to a 501c3. The center was going to rent trucks, going to pick it themselves. Um, eventually, the food company pulled out at the last minute without reason. So frustrating things there. And also to mention, this is this box here is a Gaylord. And oftentimes the food, if we could go back for a second, um, the food is packaged in bulk in these types of bins. And there's, there's not really anything that a food bank can do with loose loaves of bread put into this box, right? So those are some challenges. Um, in terms of mitigating risks, I, I see this question here in the chat. Um, there are forms that donation centers sign to release the corporation of liability. Um, even with that, there's uh, a lot of apprehension. Um, I don't know about government obstacles. I haven't encountered many of those. Um, I think that it's more internal than that. If we go to the next slide now. So animal feed, this is one that shocked me when I began to learn about it. Hopefully this is uh, legible to people. So we'll see on the left here, there's a little wheel of raw material. So traditionally what happens in making animal feed for farm animals is you take corn and grains and things like that that um, create a whole holistic diet for an animal. You put it through all these different machines, pelletize it, cook it, get rid of the, um, you know, kill the bacteria and whatnot and eventually package it up and feed it to pigs, cows, etc. There was a point, I don't know what year it was, but uh, corn prices just exploded. And these uh, animal feed proce uh, processors started to say, hey, how can we do this more cheaply? That's always the question, right? So they started saying, well, there's all this waste going on at my local Pop-Tart. Maybe I shouldn't use brand names, but my local pastry uh, processing facility. What if we took that and made it into animal food? So they did. Um, there can be anything, I mean, from pastries, breads, cookies, crackers, um, spicy chips, any sort of highly processed material that has the nutritional specs that they're looking for can go into this process. So, you know, there are even times when for cows, ruminant animals can technically digest packaging, certain types of packaging. And so the packaging will even be left in the cow food. Um, so this process pays a lot. People are, you know, wanting to avoid paying a lot for corn and wheat prices so if you have there's an incentive to have excess waste for these types of materials even chocolates um other candies so that's the incentive for these companies pays a lot you know as opposed to you paying to dispose of your waste and disincentives ethics i mean i like i said I'm just telling the facts here, but I don't know what we do with that. Um, and then facilities are limited. So not only are these geographically limited, there are only a couple across the country that are huge. Um, but, you know, I lost my second point, but <laughs> that's okay. They're, they're geographically limited and there's only a certain number of uh, things that they can uh, produce. So go on to the next slide here is an article that i pulled up again it's linked in here if anyone ends up wanting this um so here's the photo of cows eating what look like skittles um this came from mars and it's they some quotes from them the candies were intended to be used as feed the candy provides cheap carbs to the cattle um it provides a less expensive food option for us as consumers. Um, so that's a justification that they use. And they said, even though they do sell this type of material to cattle farmers, this specific batch was not supposed to go to cows is what they claimed for this situation. So 
maybe people have seen, I think there have been some viral videos of a similar process and it's absolutely 100% true. This is happening regularly. Um, all right, on to the next one, industrial uses. So there are a couple of versions of this. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is rendering. This is when you take excess um, fogs, as they're called, bats, oils, and gases, um, but specifically chunky meats, chunky fatty meats. Also, um, blood and feathers can apply here. And you put it all into a machine, you grind it up, spin it up, and it comes into like a meal, like a meat meal, bone meal, feather meal. Um, and that's used in animal feed, cosmetics, soap, things like that. So that is another way to utilize excess meat. So second, we'll talk about anaerobic digestion. This process, you take food waste and, or you know, other biosolids. So um, sludges are a common uh, byproduct in these facilities. That's just like excess. I honestly don't know the definition of sludge, but it's like a big, just if anyone has seen fern gully and it's like the big like oily glob monster, that's kind of what sludge is. So uh, that all goes into the anaerobic digester, um, is turned into digestate, which is used as fertilizer, oftentimes for um, like the big corporations, not really for um, eating purposes, and then biogas as well. And then that's a facility an anaerobic digester on the right. So maybe someone has seen these. I see these around pretty often personally. But once you know how to look for them, you're like, oh, it's an anaerobic digester. So pretty interesting. We can go to the next slide. All right, so then there's biofuel. Um, if anyone has worked at a restaurant or been to a restaurant near their dumpsters, they might have seen one of these bins. Um, you know, might say, the name Darling on it. There's some other names as well. Um, this is something that uh, the comp these oil companies offer for as a free service to restaurants. So collection of used cooking oil. Uh, this can also happen at maybe an oil processing facility. Oops, this one went rancid. Oops, this one started spilling. Pour it into the dumpster. Um, then the company will come and service that container every so often and agreed upon rate and uh, it'll go into one of these facilities and be made into a biofuel. Um, okay uh, and I saw a question about the linked articles. If you want to email me at the end of this I can uh, send you this powerpoint and they're hyperlinked into this and I'll also look into the portal and see if there's a way for me to share links and resources. All right, so uh, getting right into it. So in terms of biodiesel and the use of oils, this um, specifically, this specific article comes from an Indian news outlet. So the prices are in rupees, but the issue with this is, uh, a common issue is that people who are in the oil producing field that's meant to be for consumers have found that there's more profit to be made in the post-consumer industry than in the actual consumer industry. So they'll make your, your bottle of canola oil and then say, uh, that wasn't good enough, that didn't pass QA, and you know, send it directly to biofuel because the profits in this situation are about two times more profitable than sending it directly to the consumer. So that's a lot of wasted resources. Um, that's something that people are aware of that's something that um, there are laws and more screening being done to prevent this, but it uh, has been and still is an issue. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, great. So this is kind of like everything. So rendering, anaerobic digestion, and biofuel. What are the pros? What are the cons in a case study? Um, incentives. These practices tend to be very environmentally friendly, more so than a lot of the other processes we've talked about today. Um, occasionally, ren rendering in biogas can pay well for the um, producer of the waste. 
some disincentives is that these processes are really highly regulated. And so in order to put your waste into these facilities, it requires extensive testing. If it's a one-off dump into the system, it has to be tested. If it's an ongoing stream of this type of material, it has to be tested regularly. Testing is expensive, it takes more resources. So even if they are getting paid, there's still that uh, disincentive. There's op it often requires specific equipment to store and to haul this material. So instead of um, throwing it into a dumpster, you have to have it in tanks. You have to have it pumped out of the tanks. A lot of the times fats and oils and gases solidify uh, or freeze or in, in the summer they smell. Uh, so there's a lot of issues that come up here. Um, and then case study. Uh, many small farmers historically have had handshake deals with their local meat processing facilities. But these days, a lot of the larger companies are going around them and offering a lot more money um, in order to you know, take advantage of that stream. So they're cutting small farmers out of the picture, which seems to be a common practice. I'm sure a lot of us have seen how the percentage of industrial farmers versus small farmers and how that's declined over the years. All right, off to the next one, please. Oh, and I also wanted to mention for that last slide, a lot of these facilities do tend to be built in communities uh, with low property values. Um, and a lot of that does have to do with historical redlining. Um, so it's just another persistent issue of redlining and um, another issue that these communities have to deal with uh, that directly affect their health. All right composting. All right, so an incentive here is that it's fairly inexpensive. Um, so usually less expensive than landfilling or just just more expensive than landfilling, sorry, or right on par, depending on the volume that you're producing. Um, some disincentives. Uh, there's depending on the location, there's not always a catch all composting solution. This means that some huge composting facilities can handle packaging, can handle meat, um, can handle some of those more challenging, um, maybe small packages of sauce, like the little ketchups you get at the store. But usually that's not a possibility. So any of those small packaging, challenging packaging, um, meat items, you really need a huge industrial composter to be able to handle that. And those just aren't available everywhere. You also need very specific equipment in order to uh, have a composting program. And, you know, again, it's another cost and it, that's not always something you can convince people to do. Uh, okay, case study. Um, a company that produces salami wrapped in cellulose casing uh, with the little clips at the end wanted to compost their excess. But the nearby composters, there were two of them, only, only able to compost either meat or depackage, not both. Additionally, the metal clip made it almost impossible to find an appropriate solution. All right. So finally, we'll talk about landfill and or incineration, the last resort to disposal. Um, so landfill. Incentives, it's the cheapest. Um, they can accept almost anything. Um, there are city partnerships that can sometimes almost force you to utilize their programs, making this landfiller the only option or the only legal option to haul waste in a particular area. Um, and they always provide the equipment. They are well stocked. They know what they're doing. They're well established. And it's going to make things really easy for these people who are often very strapped on time. Disincentives are that they're not getting paid for their waste and they can't claim zero waste to landfill. Again, not my perspectives, just the perspectives of these companies that are participating in these programs. Incineration. Um, so incineration does count under zero waste to landfill policies because uh, it's not the landfill, they're uh, just burning it. And honestly, incineration is not a horrible process from what I understand about it. The problem is 
people, companies that are really committed to zero waste to landfill might be incentivized to, instead of composting or uh, you know, finding something more local to do, because they're so committed to their zero waste to landfill, they might ship it from Maine to California to, uh, to incinerate it. And so that's hauling big loads, truck loads of goods across the country to claim environmental sustainability. Um, so that's interesting. It's also more expensive than landfill and there's more paperwork involved. So similarly to some of the um, industrial uses that we spoke about earlier, they have to do extensive testing and really claim uh, what is being uh, in incinerated. And the next one. So uh, this is just um, some speaking to zero waste to landfill, as we talked about in the last slide, it's taken very literally. Did stuff go into the landfill? Um, maybe not, but it was shipped very, very far in order to avoid that. And is that does that balance itself out? All right, so that's all of the um, EPA guidelines for food waste reduction. Really interesting stuff. I hope that people learned a lot from that. Um, I also wanted to mention on the zero waste to landfill that the, the roads that are used for trucking cross country often go through really high traffic communities, really like industrialized communities. Um, air pollution is being exacerbated by all of these uh, trucks going through. That's leading to asthma. Um, that's leading to environmental degradation for specific communities and obviously globally as well. Um, so now we can move on to the next one. As we've seen, and as I've talked about in some of these pros and cons, the market economy incentivizes commodification. The model that we follow is infinite growth. Um, you make a company, you wanna just increase your profits, increase your profits. Um, I, an idea that I really liked, that I heard and read about, is um, moving towards an efficiency economy. So instead of success being defined as growing, 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 our stocks are increasing, saying, okay, what resources do we have and how efficient were we with them? How many people were we able to reach with um, the resources at hand? Um, I also want to note very clearly that population growth has never, is not and has never been the issue. Um, the allocation of resources and commodification of resources are the issues. And if anyone wants to talk or think or learn more about efficiency economy, I really recommend the book, The End of Growth, Adapting to Our New Economic Reality by Richard Heinberg. Really great book. All right, upcycling, great. Yes, this is a good thing. Maybe. So the commodification of unused food disincentivizes donation or source reduction as we've seen. Companies would prefer to send to animal feed or to, um, you know, something more financially lucrative um, than to donate. So that is a barrier that we've already seen. Um, so then what happens if you commodify the unwanted stuff? The same problems are gonna happen. These types of issues have already come up in the ugly food boxes that a lot of us have heard of. Um, so for example, these companies become the primary purchaser of produce. So instead of saying, we have this limited number of boxes because this is how much excess food there was, we're saying, oh, oh well, we have a lot of demand. We want our business to grow as ugly food boxes. Um, so we need more carrots. So um, yeah, it's just kind of like exacerbating the system as a whole. So this is my presentation portion of today's chat. Um, would love to answer any questions that people have before we maybe take a brief break and then move into the whiteboarding session.
if if folks would like to unmute themselves to ask a question, they are able to. Otherwise, you're welcome to just put it in the chat. I had a question. Um, I would love to ask if you could just go back to what you were just talking about with the upcycling. And I'm curious about your take on different, yeah, like imperfect foods and how those groups specifically can kind of go against the larger goal. Sure. Um, so yeah, again, it's commodifying food. Uh, and I think that no matter what sense we do it in, I think it is harmful. I think that it could be a form of harm reduction if we have to do it, if, it, if the only alternative was the landfill. But realistically, this ends up competing with uh, food donations, food banks, people who are able to distribute this food for free. So I would say that a better model would be to uh, for these programs to um, decommodify these goods. They're probably getting them for free or really, really discounted anyway. Um, and offering it that way. Uh, the other, another way around this, I think, is moving towards uh, CSA boxes instead, more locally grown produce. Um, in order to directly impact the farmers that are working with this produce. Um, those are just my suggestions. I'm, again, this is more of like a collaborative conversation and I'm open to any other thoughts or disagreements or anything else, but it's my, my take on this and my understanding of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank question. you so much. Um... Any other questions before we move on to the interactive portion? I have one question. Um, you, in the composting slide, you mentioned the composting is inexpensive, but when I talked to um, composting companies, like they mentioned that it is like more expensive than landfill. And I was wondering, what did you mean by like fairly inexpensive? Sure. So as you start composting on a more industrialized scale, it becomes pretty inexpensive. There are industrial composters who will accept materials for free. Um, it again depends. They're probably not going to accept goods for free if it's highly packaged or a challenging material like meat. Um, an interesting one that I worked with was compostable diapers, human diapers that were used. Um, and I was able to find an industrial composter that accepted them. So yeah, the bigger your donation, so on this industrial scale, pre-consumer scale, like I said, truckloads and truckloads and truckloads, you would not believe how many truckloads of goods are being disposed of. Um, and so if you're disposing that much in the compost facility is this big and advanced, it's going to be expensive. The smaller scale composters, um, which are the ones that actually probably have a good um, product coming out of it, those are going to be expensive. It takes work to do it. And like anything, as it becomes huge, it becomes cheaper, usually for the worse. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just had a quick question. Um, obviously, incineration is not an ideal system, especially here in the US. But I know in places like Denmark, um, incineration is really important because that's their uh, heating source. They have district heating. Um, so the, the incineration heats up the water. That water is distributed to houses and businesses surrounding that area. Um, does I don't know if you're familiar, but does that then take... Um, is that a good way to limit this food waste in uh, just general landfills since everything is incinerated? Is that a viable option? I don't know what the, also the costs of like pollution and the end product um, and the air quality around those areas. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. Yeah, so if I were to remake this pyramid, I would personally put incineration above landfill. Um, I think that there's a lot of benefits to it and I would say the net um, costs are probably less harmful than landfilling. 
Mm -hmm. um, it can really be a great system. There are closed systems. There's going to be pollution with them, but there's going to also pollution with landfills. A garden that I worked at was right next to a landfill, and we would have, you know, things blowing over the top and trash, you know, little um, chip bags flying into the garden. And we were also right next to a high school, so um, I would say, and also it was smelly. Like it's that wasn't necessarily harmful, but it wasn't fun. Um, so a lot of countries are moving towards this um, incineration uh, model. And I think that right now the problem in the United States is that I think that the trash companies are pretty powerful um, and fighting against that. And I think that we just don't have the infrastructure built and the systems built to move towards it. But I would say it would definitely be preferable to, uh, to landfilling. In terms of environmental impacts, I think that it's just a harm reduction approach. And it's like, okay, well, what's what are the net positives and net negatives? And I think thinking, having people who are making these changes think, where are we placing these? How can we more equitably distribute the placement of these types of facilities? Um, I think those are important questions to ask, but they shouldn't be prevent, preventing the processes from happening. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute. And in the chat, I will have a link to uh, the whiteboard that we're going to collaborate on. So if you do have access, please join us. Otherwise, I will screen share the image so folks on the Zoom line can still see it as well. So as you join this page, um, mine is looking a little funky. Okay, so as you join this page, you should be able to click on uh, the left hand side, there should be a little cursor button. Um, so there's the cursor, there's like a little pin, a little post it note text box. You should be able to click on the post-it notes and start typing them. So in order to do this, uh, you'll have to click on the cursor. Um, Adam, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so you'll have to click on that cursor that Adam's indicating in order to click on the post-its. And if this is, you know, if you don't have access to this website or you don't have, um, you know, if you're not able to figure it out, we can just talk about this in the chat or live as well. So once you click the cursor button, you'll double click the post it and you should be able to type from there. All right, so the question we're going to talk about is what are your thoughts on the current EPA best practices for food recovery? Was there anything I see in the chat? Someone was really shocked by the cows eating Skittles, didn't realize that was a thing. Were there, any, were there any other like surprising or interesting or concerning or exciting um, things? So hopefully the post-it note can help to make this a little less nerve-wracking because it's anonymous, more or less. Um, yeah, we'll just give everyone a moment to answer. Again, just make sure you have the cursor here selected in order to grab the post-it and move it to the side and then double click your post-it in order to chat or to fill in your response. And then I'm happy to move things also, but when you're done, if you can move it under the question to kind of have it all in one spot, I'm move some of them. So some feedback I'm seeing is the EPA 
SMM program does not support waste to energy and incineration. It's dirty and expensive. Interesting. I would be curious to know um, more from that, that person if anyone wants to speak to that. And if not, that is A okay. Read another one. At some point, we need to make sure there is a financial burden to wasted food for the generators. Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's really interesting that you can make excess oil or excess food and still profit from it. Um, I think that's not, not a great policy to have, right? So that's something that I didn't talk about much in this presentation is that policy, it seems to be pretty limited <clears throat> in this space. And I think that policy, the policies that do exist do tend to make an impact because these companies don't want to make these changes, but when they have to, then they do, um, unless the fines are too small. So very interesting. All right, let's see. Did you want us to use color-coded post-it notes to match the questions over to the left? Or does no, that not no, matter? answer in whatever color post-it you want. And if we run out of post-its, you can click the post-it on the left-hand side of your screen. Or it looks like you might be able just to press in as well. Yeah, interesting. All right. You are also able to um, grab a corner of your post-it and increase the size, if that would help make some of this more legible. Don't feel obligated or anything. <laughs> yeah, you can make it bigger. You can also so use your own cursor to scroll in and out um, to some of the small, more small text. Um, let's see. Lack of government involvement. Maybe government should provide grants or stipends for responsible food waste reduction. Yeah, I think that could be a really great policy. Um, I think a challenge there might be tracking of it. It seems to go missing often. Even sometimes, you know, you send 60 truckloads to, of something to a composter and only 40 arrive. And it's like, where the heck did it go? Um, but yeah, it's really interesting thinking about the lack of government involvement when there's a lot of involvement in other spaces. Um, all right. It was surprising to learn that imperfect and ugly produce reselling can be harmful, a harmful model of reducing waste. Yeah, I think it's surprising as well. I think that it can be approached as, again as harm reduction while we're working with this system. It's probably better than a lot of other systems. So I definitely don't wanna disincentivize that. But if we were gonna make a hierarchy of um, food, you know, produce purchasing, maybe focusing on local CSAs first, local uh, farmers markets, then ugly food purchasing, and uh, then your grocery stores. And of course, you know, we have food deserts and a lot of other issues that are affecting us. So it's not always an option. So wherever you can get your food is a good place to get your food. I think the lobby of these corporations is powerful that it prevents any significant change? I would say so. Um, I think that also the waste, um, like the landfilling companies have really powerful people involved as well. All right, um, these are really interesting. I think that there's a way for me to organize these and send out the link later. So I'm gonna send that link out and move on to the next question because I really wanna think about the future. So these are interesting points, but maybe we can talk on Zoom about um, what might future community food systems look like and how might, might that, how might they mitigate the harm being done by corporations while they do still exist? Also thinking about how might systems like community gardening, food swap programs, mitigate the food, the food apartheid. Um, and what are some issues that we might be able to anticipate with the popularization? So just, you know, maybe something to write in the chat, to write about on this post-it note, or talk audibly out here as well on the Zoom. I didn't know that my presentation would actually take an hour. So <laughs> sorry, I thought we might have more time to go through these questions. 
but I really like, like to see your answers and I hope that these questions um, sparked some, some new knowledge and some ways of thinking about uh, industrial food waste. And I hope that we see more organizing around this space moving forward because I think the first problem is lack of knowledge in a lot of ways. And so the more we talk about this, the more we denormalize this really, um, the, the more that we're able to do as community members and activists to make change. Again, as uh, JC stated, if you are comfortable, feel free to unmute yourself. If you'd like to share, or ask another question. Uh, question. Um, I have a question um, about the about France's ban on burning and dyeing and cutting. Um, is there anywhere in the U.S. that is talking about doing that, or and when did that happen? So the French ban on um, disposing of pre like stuff that hasn't hit consumers yet uh, was in 2016, um, to the best of my research abilities. Um, so it's been some time, and I think that there are more. There's more legislation popping up globally. It's a discussion that's talked about more, especially with all of these viral TikTok videos and other types of videos where people are exposing the practice. Um, so th that was the first part of the question. Has anyone in the US talked about this? I'm sure it's being talked about. Is it a reality? Um, I would say probably before it becomes law that it's banned, it would become recommendation that you don't. Right now, I don't think that that is official recommendation anywhere. and. Um, anywhere in the United States. And I, I hope to see it soon. But as of now, I, I don't believe there's any anything of the sort. Anyone feel free to contradict me. Um, thank you. I'm just really curious about that policy and how it's working out for France and if it could work anywhere in the States. Right, like, was it really beneficial? Have they seen net positive change from it? I would, I would really love to do a deeper dive into that policy aspect of it as well, because a bad policy is not going to make change, I guess. Um, so I hope that if we do and when we do move in that direction, that we can go into it in an informed way with few loopholes. Like, if you're zero waste to landfill but shipping across the country, is that good? You know. I think we're over time, but oh, um, if you want to, Adam, bring up the last slide of the PowerPoint, I have my contact information there. Sure. Um, so in the middle, um, feel free to reach out to me if you want the slides, if you want to ask me questions. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Those would be the two best places to reach out to me. But yeah, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk more about what I know or about uh, my organizing experience and, you know, dreaming up a, a better future for this system. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you all coming. Really cool.